and um, I have a Monk Cello Cello Studio. I was born in New Mexico. It was uh, a university town um, in the desert, and I think that anyone who lives in New Mexico is really very close to the land. My family spent a lot of time really doing rough camping. <laughs> so, uh, you know, not too much preparation. Let's go and, you know, forget your matches and, you know, sleeping bag or something. But we still made it through. But my parents were very spontaneous people. My great-grandfather had gone to Nicaragua in 1900. So my grandmother, her, I grew up hearing all these stories of Nicaragua as a girl. And she wanted to go and her father did not want her to go. Um, so she just went. She, she just um, you know, married this newspaper uh, fellow and they did all kinds of things. So they took my mom out of school and they would just drive all the way to Panama on a thousand dollars. There are a lot of stories of my mom in jungles, on boats, and you know, monkeys and things like that. So I grew up with that. So I would say, you know, a lot of the influences in my life came from my mom and dad as being, taking us and doing neat things. We lived in Romania for a year. We camped all across Europe. My dad is a poet. Uh, he passed away about 10 years ago. And um, he's a very fine poet. He had been a naval officer and um, he always um, read a lot. And he was an engineer. Um, but his true love was writing, and he um, met my mom, and um, she is the daughter of a poet. My mom had studied piano a bit, and she had some beautiful parts of pieces she could play on the piano. And she would just, when we were little kids, throw a bunch of pots and pans and forks and knives and spoons and everything and scarves and costumes and we would just run around the house like little crazy people to the music and dance and bump, jump up and down and she is a very free spirit. So I heard the cello first when I was in sixth grade and a quartet came to my classroom and I just was like shaken by the sound of the cello. I really, I just, I had been trying to do ballet and I was uh, really not a ballerina, but I loved dancing to the music. I just didn't, I loved the music of the ballet. I went home and I asked my parents and they right away helped me get a cello. And um, my first teacher was such an, a huge influence on me. His name was Mr. Kramer. He had such an amazing character. He was so kind. We just loved him. He was our second father. It was like uh, we all just hung out in the orchestra room all the time. It was, we, we could just be so honest with him. He came to my wedding. I kept up with him until he passed away. In terms of my husband, um, we actually grew up in the same town uh, from middle school on, and we knew each other in high school. We were in a group of friends um, who were drama club, German club, orchestra, kids who hung together, you know. Long story short, we started dating in college. We had a German lit class together, and he was my competition in that class. And all of a sudden, I, I thought, wow, here's this guy who studies science, and he's so interested in literature. And then I found out he absolutely adores classical music and played the organ and like had so many records. You know, we've had a lot of journeys together. We've grown up together. He's always been completely supportive of my music and uh, inspirational to my music. But we also shared a, uh, I helped him full time with his PhD in Sumatra, in the jungles of Sumatra, and I guess, you know, it came to me when I was out there that 
it wasn't such an odd place for me to be since my mother had grown up in, you know, traveling through Central America. And living in raw nature was absolutely incredible for me. And it was a very musical experience because the Gibbons have solos and duets that they do all through, and you hear them from miles away. And the Siamang um, are uh, related and we were following these four groups of lesser apes um, for two and a half years. Kitchen while I was practicing, so uh, he was quite a clever little guy. I would really felt very welcome as a musician. Right when I stepped off the plane in Indonesia, this person, I come out of the door of the airport and this man turns to me, the young guy says, Music America, number one. And I was like, wow, that's amazing, you know. We were invited to this festival way up in the mountains and I was really struck by this, uh, it was something like the dance of a thousand hands and it had this, these really, really fast hand movements. Everybody was dressed in ethnic clothing and, and it was in this small room and in the United States it would be called a competition. And I kept watching and watching and I was noticing all of a sudden that the, the kids who just were learning were paired against the most advanced dancers. And I was like, what's going on? You know, is this a good, that's not a fair competition, you know? And someone explained to me, no, but they're learning from them. That they put them both at the same time so the youngsters can see what the older ones are doing and how to, how to follow them in their, and that to me was really earth shaking, kind of like, wow, what a concept, you know? <laughs> it's just a great way to, to meet people. I had a problem with my cello once, and of course they heard me playing cello all the time. My cello in uh, the um, sound post in this aluminum cello, it fell down. I went to a big construction site and I asked these guys, you know, I could take my cello, this is, you know, who I am, what I'm doing, I have this cello, can you help me? And someone devised a way to fix it for me. But, you know, I'm standing with all these guys and normally that wouldn't be the way things were too much, you know. So I really felt like it, it gave me a certain way to, to reach out to a poppy, part of the population that I wouldn't normally interact with in that way. I had been studying with a really famous teacher who was also one of my great um, inspirations in life. Her name is Margaret Rowell, and she is just a grand dame of cello in the Bay Area. She also had just an amazing way of teaching, and it really influenced how I teach now. She and I really hit it off right away, and I studied on, on and off, you know, various forays into jungles and stuff with her. And my very first lesson when I auditioned for her, she told me, I told her I was going to be going to the jungle. And she said, oh, I have just the cello for you. And it turned out that she knew this woman who had um, played the cello and um, she wanted to go to work as a nurse in Lebanon. And she bought a cello from someone, and the cello had quite a story. It had actually been on a U-boat in World War II. It actually it was made by someone in Greece in uh, before around the time of World War One. And when I had gotten it, actually uh, somebody. Um, People have taken it, had taken it on research ex expeditions in the Arctic, and um, she had lent it to some other people before. So I uh, leased it from her for two and a half years. It was just the perfect instrument for me. After a few years, I asked her. I, I came up with this idea of taking some lessons with some of her students as well. And she said, oh, go for it. I, it kind of struck me once I was starting to teach, learn from those other teachers, 
that the different voices, often they were saying the same thing my, my main teacher was saying, but I heard it in a different way. And so I do that with my students now. Starting in seventh or eighth grade, after I've been teaching them since fourth or fifth grade, I like them, first of all, to have a lot of master classes here and there if they can. Uh, and sometimes I'll just say, hey, you know, have a lesson with this person. So what happens is they'll start off by just having one lesson every four or five weeks, and then it graduates to one lesson a month. And then by the time they're in 10th or 11th grade, it's like two lessons with them, two lessons with me. And we, really, it's such a great thing because I learn different things. They'll say, oh, well, this person does that, and you're saying this. And I said, well, try it, do it. That's why we're doing this. And, you know, really, in this area, there's so many fine musicians with, between, you know, the school orchestras and, you know, people that I play with and ensembles and concerts that are around. Uh, it's just amazing. I've been teaching actually since I was in high school. <laughs> My orchestra teacher who I talked about, Mr. Kramer, just came to me one day when I was in 10th grade, and I guess 11th grade, and said, I have five students for you. Like, oh gosh, and one was a 60 year old man. I was like, oh my God. But you know, then I taught all through college and um, I did take a break when I was in San Francisco area. But then uh, I've taught a lot and I really enjoy it. I really enjoy communicating and learning um, with my students. And many, my husband, uh, when I first moved to this area, um, I had a student who was quite advanced and I got nervous and, I, and, he, and he said, oh my God, you know, so, so what, you haven't played a concerto. Learn it and teach it. That's what I do all the time at the university. And that's been exciting for me because sometimes I'm kind of learning alongside my students and, and I'm just, uh, you know, I find that really exciting. Just working with students is fantastic. I have really great students and in the, not just musically, but as people. And I feel like a lot of times we just really get to know each other and that means so much to me. You know, if cello or music is awkward for someone, that's how it was for me. So I really, I wanted to teach because there are lots of things, the way I was taught initially wasn't actually the easiest way to flow with the cello. <laughs> I was very awkward, grab things a lot. Um, and I feel like I'm constantly learning and that's the way Margaret Rowell was. She was just so full of life, so full of energy, so full of curiosity and my parents were like that too and I think uh, it's just really important to embrace the world and keep keep trying, you know, and it may take a while to get smooth at the cello, but I feel um, singing is a really big part of our life and that music is in all the main things that happen in life. I was playing in a little church in uh, in Kenya and it was kind of made out of plastic sheets and poles and um, I was playing Ave Maria and all of a sudden somebody is accompanying me. Out of nowhere people had big sort of like um, laundry detergent tubs and oil tubs and they're banging on the benches and you know rattling pans and they were just music came from everywhere and it was so exciting at, at the end I just kept playing for a while and they were just accompanying me so I think um, you know I have been in a group once where nobody spoke anyone else's language we just played quartets <laughs> and that was it we, we could do everything together and we didn't even just like hello <laughs> so music really um, has shaped my life in a big way I have made some choices in my life, like going off to live in the jungle and things like that, and Africa and all of that, because um, I, I really um, wanted to combine music with life, and I, everybody does that in some way. And I would say that 
in both my case and my husband's case, we've had naysayers in our life, like, oh, a professional musician, or, you know, doing this, uh, oh, you'll never get a grant to do what you, you need to do. There aren't grants, you know. Well, my husband worked incredibly hard, and sometimes you have to submit grants three times. Um, and we lived on pennies in the jungle. And in Africa, we um, ended up, you know, going to Africa with our two kids to start research, and we had to borrow the money for the tickets. But because we weren't paying rent, we paid ourselves back over time, and we did this a couple of times. And we had a, you know, like Land Rover that was made up of like 15 different Land Rovers, you know, and it broke down a lot, but we, we managed to do it on, we just were determined to do it.